All right, good evening, Christian Life. It's my pleasure to be able to join you all today as we uh, take a little journey through God's Word to look at the topic of suffering. And the reason we're going to be going through this is a friend of mine from the church uh, reached out and had some questions about this subject. And so it caused me to do some thinking about it and really ponder, you know, what is the purpose of suffering and how, if all we see is suffering throughout this world, how are we able to to uh, show an unbeliever the eternal perspective of who Jesus is and how much, how great of a God we really have when there's so much suffering throughout the world. And so today I want to go into scriptures and uh, just kind of learn from what Paul and Peter had to say about the subject. And the first place I want to go is 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm going to be starting in verse 12. And it says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so that's from Peter, and uh, I think it's pretty clear to, and you know, pretty straightforward that we should not be surprised at the fiery trial that each of us will inevitably have to walk through here in this earth. And I think it's pretty interesting that he makes it pretty clear that it's not just unbelievers who are going to have to suffer. And I don't know about you, but uh, to me, when I think about, you know, when I was first learning about Jesus. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is blessing and peace and joy and prosperity and all of these good things that we believe are going to happen as we come to Jesus and as he saves her, our life. And to be honest, yeah, that, that's a portion of it. I think there's a lot of blessings that have come into my life since I gave my life over to him. I'm able to be at peace. I'm able to be at, experience joy. God has absolutely transformed my life. He has blessed me with a beautiful wife, an amazing son, uh, an amazing relationship with my Heavenly Father. And those are all very good things. But the very cool thing that I've learned to experience is that those things can all still exist even if my circumstances don't line out the way that I would want them to be or the way that I would even expect them to be. Because the reality is time and time again in the Bible, you know, James uh, chapter 1 mentions, consider it pure joy when you experience trials of many kind. What in the world is that even supposed to mean? And you hear uh, Peter say, rejoice when you uh, share in Christ's sufferings. See, the Bible continues to tell us to rejoice and to be in joy when we're going through trials, when we're experiencing suffering. And that's a really hard thing for us to be able to process and to connect is why would those two things be synonymous inside of the Word of God? And I think a really great example of that uh, comes from looking at the life of Paul in Acts chapter 16. And at this point in Paul's life, he's literally imprisoned for his faith. And what we're going to experience as we read is watching how Paul responded to the circumstances that he was dealt. And we're in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 16. It says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, and who proclaim to you the way of salvation. 
And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them in prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the, in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So we see something fascinating about the way that Paul responded to the suffering and the circumstances of his life. Was Paul right to be thrown in prison for casting a demon, an evil spirit, out of a woman? Absolutely not. You think that if you were to do that for somebody that you would be honored for have praying and rejoicing that the Lord would deliver somebody from an evil spirit like that. Instead, Paul is repaid by he and Silas being thrown into prison. And if I were to put myself in that position, man, I'd be pretty bummed out at that point. Number one, he's fastened into stocks. He's not just sitting in prison. He's unable to really move. That would be extremely uncomfortable. And knowing that you did not deserve the penalty that you were enduring, it would be really easy to get caught up in your mind and think, man, woe is me. And begin to just feel sorry for myself and just begin to be depressed and go, God, how in the world would you let this happen? And if all of us are really honest with ourselves, I think we look at the circumstances of our life quite often and look to Jesus and say, God, why in the world would you let this happen? And we get discouraged and we lose hope and we begin to lose our faith. But what Paul begins to do in this moment is really profound because instead of allowing his circumstances to define his relationship with God, he and Silas both begin to raise their voice and begin begin to sing. 
king, and they began to worship their God. You see, their circumstances did not define their response. They continued to live out their relationship with Jesus the same way they would if they were out of prison, giving God the glory that he deserved. And what was the result about them having an eternal mindset uh, of them living out their joy in the middle of suffering? Not only did their bonds break, not only were they loosed from the stocks, but everybody around them experienced that same exact thing. And not only that, but the chief jailer, uh, who was about to commit suicide because he thought everybody had escaped, he ended up giving his life to Jesus, and not just him, but his entire household, because of the God that Paul and Silas were able to introduce to them in the middle of their suffering. And notice how God came through in the end, and they weren't in prison for long, uh, and they were justified at the end of the testing of their faith. And that's exactly how we need to live as Christians. It's so easy for our sufferings in this world to discourage us and to get us off track and to give up hope. But when we choose to be filled with joy in the middle of our sufferings and we begin to choose to worship God instead of become discouraged by our sufferings, we're actually able to persevere through those things. And you know what that shows the world? It shows the world the eternal perspective. It's not just convincing them with words that this is what you should do. It's living that out in front of them. And your life becomes that very testimony that they need to see that God is the one and only God. Because only he could produce what is going on in his son or his daughter uh, during a time like this. That's not something any normal human being can do. That was a divine encounter from the Lord that caused them to respond in such a way. And that's the ultimate goal, is that we would be ambassadors of Christ, representing Him in the world, not allowing our circumstances to dictate how we respond, but responding solely off of who Jesus is, worshiping Him, not caring what we get in return here on this earth, but living out that eternal perspective, knowing that heaven is our eternal home, and that's where our riches should be stored. Not in what I can gain here, but what I can gain eternally. And so I want to encourage you with that. If you find yourself in the middle of suffering, let that be your motivation to begin lifting your voice to Jesus and singing praise and glorifying him, because that is how we get through our suffering here on earth. And that is how we represent him and show ourselves to be overcomers to all the unbelievers who are watching our every move and wondering why uh, being a Christian is any different than any other thing you could be doing in this world. And so I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, many of you will be joining us at Meals for the Heartland. I'm really looking forward to being able to serve with everybody again. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all here on Sunday. Have a great rest of your week.